Welcome to the Neubauer Collegium for Culture and Society's Director's Lecture. I am Jonathan Lear, the Roman Family Director, and tonight we shall hear Professor Vikram Patel speak on the topic, Reimagining Mental Health in the Shadow of the Pandemic. This is the first time we are having a Director's Lecture on Zoom, so let me say a word about logistics. Professor Patel will speak, and then Professor Deborah Gorman-Smith, the Dean of the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago, will open a discussion with Professor Patel. We will then have a question and answer period from the audience. And if you have questions, please type them in the uh, Q&A box below. And um, I shall raise them and be the moderator. And the event will end by 6.30 p.m. Chicago time. Now, in this first Zoom lecture, it is fitting that we talk about mental health because it's crucial to realize that before this pandemic hit, we were already in a terrible pandemic that few recognized as such. This is a crisis of the mental well-being of our youth. And as Professor Patel will show us in a moment, the measurable rates of depression and anxiety, feelings of low self-esteem, of suicidal thoughts, of suicides among people 10 to 25, year old, 25 years old have skyrocketed over the past two decades. The rates of dysphoria and self-harm increase alarmingly as children grow into teenage and young adult years. There are differences to be measured of, according to race and economic standing, sexual orientation and geographical location. But this pandemic of mental well-being threatens youth all across the board. The pandemic was with us before the coronavirus pandemic. It is being shaped by current circumstances. And should we be fortunate enough to emerge from the coronavirus pandemic, the mental health pandemic will still be with us. It's a crisis we've begun to recognize. It's one we must come to understand better. And uh, it's a crisis we must solve. Now, I can think of no one who can better help us understand the situation than Professor Vikram Patel. Vikram Patel is the Pershing Square Professor of Global Health and Wellcome Trust Principal Research Fellow at the Harvard Medical School. It is not an exaggeration to say that he has devoted his life to understanding and promoting the well being of youth. His work has focused on the burden of mental health problems, their association with social disadvantage and the use of community resources for their prevention and treatment. Among other positions, he is co-founder of the Movement for Global, health, Global Mental Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and Sangath, an NGO in India, which won the Public Health Champion of India Prize awarded by the World Health Organization. In the United Kingdom, he is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, and he has been awarded an honorary OBE. In India, he served on the committee which drafted India's first national mental health policy. Vikram Patel has been awarded major prizes in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and India for his contributions to global health. And just a few years ago, Time Magazine listed him as one of the 100 most influential people of the year. Now, if we were all together, I would in this next moment hear your warm and welcoming applause. And I do miss that. Uh, I look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you all back on a, another location, another time and into our physical space. But I also trust in our imaginations. So please join me in welcoming Professor Vikram Patel, who will speak to us on the topic, reimagining mental health in the shadow of the pandemic. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Leah. If I may call you Jonathan, um, given the wonderful interactions we've had um, in, the, in the months leading up to this event. And can I just start by saying, it is such a great loss for me um, that I am not with you all in person. Um, uh, it is a great loss that I can't visit one of my favorite cities. I have, I have an excuse to actually visit Chicago again. But I certainly hope that this, um, this is only the first of what might hopefully turn out to be a series of other interactions with, uh, with those of you who have joined this lecture. And the lecture, of course, as uh, Jonathan has 
rightly pointed out, is not just a subject that has been at the center of my own work for the better part of two decades, but I think it is also a subject that is potentially the single most important issue that affects, should affect all of us, both here in the US and around the world. And that is the health and well being of our young people. Let me uh, uh, open up my slides. Um, uh, right now, let's see where that is. Okay. Um, this might. It's interesting. I need to just find my presentation, which was there a moment ago. Ah, there you are. Right. I hope that you can see my slide, Jonathan. I, I hope people can see my slides. Um, if someone can just indicate yes. Yes, we can see your slides. All right, terrific, thank you. All right, so um, my, my lecture today is really about my grave concern that we have thrown young people under the bus, as, as, um, as the title suggests, particularly so, as we shall see later on in my talk, thanks to the pandemic. The concerns that young people have about their well-being and their development seem to have been completely ignored. And I'm sure we will turn back to the subject during the Q&A. But let me first start by uh, giving you an outline of what I hope to cover in, in, in my lecture. The first is why youth mental health matters, um, and especially so now more than ever before. And what should we be concerned about when we talk about youth mental health? The second part is what makes young people vulnerable to develop mental health difficulties? What affects their well being? And then finally, how can we reimagine mental health for young people in the pandemic era? Let me start with something that I think is self evident why young people matter. I don't need to spell this out, but it's important to recognize that young people, uh, millennials or Generation Z, as some would refer to them, are often described by economists as the world's demographic dividend. And what they're really referring to is the fact that young people are the economic engine of every society across history and across place. But I think more importantly, young people are also the vanguard of social movements. And I think we see evidence of that around us all the time. If we consider the social movements to protect our planet, the social movements to combat extremist ideologies, you will almost always see young people right at the leadership. It's fair to say then, that the health and well being of young people is, in fact, of critical importance to everyone, especially those of us who are much older now, but can see that our planet and the social world that we live in is being increasingly threatened. Is there a problem? This data comes from about five years ago. And you can already see the mounting problem that existed even before the pandemic. On this slide, what you can see are the prevalence rates of depression and anxiety on the left hand side and the prevalence of suicide attempts, not just thinking about suicide, but actually attempting suicide. And, and what's, what's very obvious here is that these rates are astonishingly high. There are some differences between the various ethnic and racial groups in America. Interestingly enough, Actually, the highest rates for depression and anxiety are in white youth. But if you look at suicide attempts on the right hand side, nearly 10% across all racial and ethnic groups had reported a suicide attempt in the prior year, which is, in my mind, already an astonishingly high uh, figure. If I had to look at these same data now, but looking at self reported uh, uh, depression or anxiety or suicide attempts according to uh, a sexual, according to gender and sexual orientation, let's see what these figures show us. Well, the rates are higher in women, and this is again a well described phenomenon across the world, but particularly high in transgender youth. And if I had to look at sexual orientation, again, uh, very much uh, as has been reported and well recognized, the rates tend to be highest um, in transgender, but particularly bisexual young people and young people who are uh, describe themselves as gay and lesbian. Again, extremely high rates in some of these groups. If you look at uh, transgender youth, you know, 30% plus, a third of them have actually reported attempting suicide in the previous 12 months. 
even before the pandemic, and this is data from 2018, suicide was already the second leading cause of death in young Americans. And if you consider that many unintentional injuries, which include, for example, road traffic accidents, were also linked to poor mental health, for example, due to substance use, then it is very obvious here that the two leading causes of death across youth are related either directly or indirectly to mental health. And you can see the contribution of suicide falls as you go into older age groups. And this is actually a pattern that has been seen globally as well. Here, what I'm showing you is a chart that shows the relative burden of mental and substance use conditions across the life course. We should just ignore uh, the neurodegenerative conditions on the right-hand side. But if you just focus on the blue and the gray bars, the blue bars are mental and substance use conditions, and the gray bars are self-harm. And these are classified separately by the World Health Organization, and that is why they're reported separately on this chart from the Global Burden of Disease uh, program um, at the University of Washington. And on the left-hand side of the, the y-axis, you can see the total proportion of the overall burden of disease that can be attributed uh, to these different conditions. And it's very obvious here that the, the, the real bulge, as it were, in terms of the relative contribution of mental and substance use disorders and self-harm uh, is actually in young adulthood between the ages of 10 and 30. If you had to add the gray bars to the blue bars, you can see that you know, it almost exceeds a fifth of the total burden of disease in these populations. But the thing that should really worry us is that it's actually been getting worse in the last decade. And it's interesting how this particular statistic has been well under the radar, even though it is so dramatic. Suicide rates, if we take that as, a, 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 as one of the most important metrics that measure population mental health, have been going up across all age groups, as you can see on this slide in the US. But it is truly astonishing to me that the rates have gone up by nearly 50% in young Americans. And it's, it's, it's astonishing because we don't really see a commensurate conversation in our society uh, about this particular fact. Imagine any other health condition, say for example, breast cancer or, or heart disease or any, really any other health condition. If you had to see a 50% increase in death rates due to any other health condition in the last decade, you can imagine that this would set off alarm bells everywhere but not so when it comes to this particular health condition. Importantly, you can also see that these suicide rate increases have been seen in virtually all states. But I think it's also important to remember that not all states show similar increases, clearly suggesting that place matters, that the ecology, the environment that you're living in does actually influence suicide rates as well. There isn't a consistent increase across all the states of America. It's also important for us to recognize that these increases are not only true in the US. You can also see them in other wealthy countries. You might wonder why I have uh, chosen wealthy countries, because those are the countries in which suicide uh, mortality rates are most accurately reported uh, every year. And here again, you can see over a decade uh, in England and Australia, astonishing increases in those countries as well. If you look, for example, in Australia, almost 100% increase in young men uh, over the last decade, but at least a 50% increase in both countries across both genders. This is truly worrying that in wealthy countries around the world, and I'm pretty sure if we had to look at low and middle income countries and had good data such as this, that we might see equally worrying trends of rising suicide rates. This is not suicide attempts or thinking about suicide. This is suicide mortality. Um, and we see rising rates across all these different wealthy countries in the last decade. I'd like to now turn to the second part of my talk. So I think, you know, in, in the first part, what I've hopefully uh, shown you is that not only are mental health problems and suicide behavior very common in young people, the commonest phase in life, in which uh, the, the phase in life where we see the largest contribution of these problems uh, to, to, to the burden of ill health, but that also the problems have been getting worse in the last decade. I'd like to now turn to the question of why. And I want to organize my, my remarks about the why in four broad domains of reasons. And I want to start, first of all, by simply trying to understand the developmental characteristics of adolescence. Now, many of us are prone to think that this is a modern problem. 
many of us, particularly those of us who are parents of adolescents, we really see our teenagers at home as being passionate, irascible, and just simply incredibly impulsive. They just simply don't think before they act. And many of us think this is a modern problem of our modern times. Except that, of course, this particular statement was made a long, long time ago by the Greek philosopher Aristotle. For far too long, we haven't really understood the developmental neuroscience of young adulthood. What we have begun to discover, first of all, and it's important to point out, is of course the brain is a work in progress right through our life. Unlike what I was taught when I was a medical student, that you know, pretty much after the first couple of years of life, it's, uh, it's essentially a downhill process all the way from then. You just keep losing brain volume and neuronal density. Um, and so essentially there's precious little more you can do after the first few years of life to, uh, to, to as it were, strengthen brain health. Today we know that's not true. Today we know, for example, that neuronal plasticity, the ability of the brain to respond to the environment, uh, not just in terms of its, um, its volume, but also the density of neural connections is actually something that stays with us across our life course. Of course, this is why when one has a stroke when you're 70 years old, you can actually recover many of your motor functions through various forms of therapies. But it is also true that plasticity that is, the ability of the brain to respond to the environment is maximal in the first two decades of life, especially the first five years of life. And I'll turn to why that is important in a moment. But what we've already discovered in the last decade is that there are also other developmental processes that are taking place, particularly in the age a range of between 10 and 24. And in the next couple of slides, I want to just summarize in a very simple way uh, what that new developmental neuroscience shows us. What this shows us is that deep structures of the brain um, that neuroscientists call the limbic system mature really around the pubertal period of life, between the ages of about 10 to 14 or 15. And this is the deep structure of the brain that mediates what neuroscientists, and I kid you not, they call them hot emotions, um, uh, mediate these emotions, emotions like rage, fear, joy, and excitement. And that the brain is hypersensitive to the thrill of risk and rewards during this very early phase of adolescence. Now, what neuroscience also shows us is that not all of the brain matures at the same time. So while the limbic cortex has matured in early adolescence, the prefrontal cortex, the stuff of the brain just behind your forehead, which is of course where higher executive functions are actually mediated, is actually still developing and immature during that period. In fact, the prefrontal cortex achieves full maturity only in young adulthood. So you can begin to see what's going on here. The part of the brain that mediates raw emotions, the part of the brain that is actually hypersensitive to risk-taking and impulsivity and thrills and rewards really, is maturing fully six to eight years before the part of the brain that is asking you to stop and think before you act. Now, while neuroscientists, of course, uh, have only figured this out in the last decade and a half, one guy actually figured this out a long time ago, and that's, of course, Walt Disney. If you consider virtually all of Walt Disney's movies, you will find that the vast majority of them almost always have a, the equivalent of an adolescent in the animal kingdom or in, sometimes in, uh, in the human species. Let's take the example of the famous Lion King film. I think most of you have probably seen that film, and you will remember the young Simba who was told by his dad, do not venture out into the remote parts of the savannah where the evil Uncle Mufasa is living, because there are some really bad things going on there, and you'll land up in danger. And of course, we all know what little Simba does, because he is so completely turned on by the idea of taking thrills, of, of, of taking a risk. Similarly, I think you can see the parallels of Finding Nemo. Nemo's dad tells him, do not swim up to the surface of the ocean because there are fishermen there and you are going to get caught in a net. And of course, precisely that is what Nemo does. But my favorite Disney film, which is of course a, uh, an adaptation of Rudyard Kipling's book, which comes from my home country, India, is that, of course, uh, of Mowgli um, in, the, uh, in, um, in the Jungle Book. And here, of course, we know the story about Mowgli, who is completely in love with living in the jungle with the animals and all the other, uh, you know, fun that he has with Baloo the bear. And he's never going to leave the jungle, never ever. He, this is his home 
until one day he happens to walk down to a forest stream and he sees this person. And of course, we all know how the story of the Jungle Book ends as he wanders dazed out of the forest to follow this pretty young girl into the human village that borders the jungle. What does this mean? In a nutshell, this means that young people are biologically and evolutionarily primed to behave the way they do, that is to take risks, to be impulsive, to be driven by their raw emotions. And this is actually quite important from an evolutionary perspective because this is the phase in life when you are gradually moving away from being totally dependent on your parents for every need and your security to becoming a fully autonomous adult in which you're going to have to make decisions both for yourself and indeed for people who depend on you. And so if you did not take risks, if you did not learn from the consequences of risk taking, then you will not in fact be able to manage your life as an adult. So this offers major advantages, but also represents very unique vulnerabilities, particularly if your environment is very toxic. This is, these are the advantages you really need. This is the part that the, the stage in our life, perhaps where we navigate the most numerous and critical life transitions. We attain sexual maturity, we establish intimate relationships, we complete education, we have to find a job. And mind you, many of these, as I'll turn to in a moment, have been thrown completely under the bus by the pandemic. And of course, we establish a unique sense of self and purpose. But let me turn to also how the plastic brain, the brain that is highly responsive to the environment, the brain that is actually undergoing dramatic changes during adolescence, also poses very particular vulnerabilities if the environment is toxic. And I want to start with very early life environments. We all know that toxic childhood environments, I call it the equivalent for mental health as tobacco is for physical health is the most consistently demonstrated risk factor for poor mental health and well-being across the life course. Not only is it a very important risk factor for mental health, but as the CDC tells us, that not only do adverse childhood experiences predict poor mental health in the form of depression, self-harm, and a number of other mental health conditions, but also it also predicts a number of other health conditions like heart disease, which are of course very closely tied with behavioral risk factors such as smoking, exercise, and diet. And of course, that is also why you could prevent a whole number of not just mental health problems, but also cardiometabolic problems if we were able to prevent adverse childhood experiences. Now, when people think of adverse childhood experiences, the first thing that comes to their mind is, you know, very extreme forms of trauma, such as, for example, sexual violence. And of course, that is a very serious traumatic event that does increase the vulnerabilities for poor mental and physical health across the life course quite dramatically. But actually, there are far more pervasive and common everyday kinds of adverse childhood experiences that are actually highly prevalent in our society. And of course, leading the pack is, house, is, is, is poverty, family poverty, living up, living in a, in a home in which it is hard to cover even the basics of everyday life, such as food and housing. This affects fully one fifth of America's households. And of course, thanks to the pandemic, we're probably going to see that figure rise quite dramatically in the year ahead. And there are also other very common kinds uh, of adversities uh, that young children face in American households, such as parental conflict and separation. So it's important for me to point out that adverse childhood environments are far more protein and are far more pervasive and widely experienced by young people uh, in America today than the usual image that people have of adverse childhood environments. Let me now turn a little bit further down the life course into adverse or toxic environments that happen when you're already a young person. And of course, when you're already a young person, the most important influences shift from the influences that your parents and your, uh, and your, and your siblings have on you as, as, as a young child to the influences that your peers have on you. And here too, we see a really serious problem. 
These data come from the surveys that have been uh, conducted to monitor sexual assault and misconduct uh, in 21 uh, American schools, both representing private as well as public institutions. And here I've shown data that come from two different years of the survey, 2015 and just last year. And as you look at the two slides, the left-hand slide shows you rates uh, uh, of non-consensual sexual contact uh, to, uh, according to gender for, for men, for women, uh, and for transgender, queer, and non-binary youth. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, for uh, undergraduates, and the right-hand side, you can see for graduates. The first thing that, of course, will strike you is how astonishingly common these experiences are, particularly for young women uh, and for young transgender, queer, and non-binary youth. The second thing you will see is that the rates have actually gone up quite dramatically, particularly for young women. It's a real relief to see the, the decline for transgender, queer, and non-binary youth, but of course they already started from a very high baseline back in 2015. Let's pause and think about these numbers. 25% of young graduate students who are women in 21 schools of America reported non-consensual sexual contact by physical force or inability to consent since they had enrolled in school. One out of four. To me, that is an absolutely astonishing and mind-boggling number. And of course, this is another very important kind of toxicity that affects young people's well-being. Now, I'm pretty sure that many of you must be wondering about social media. There's a lot of conversations about social media uh, these days. And of course, it is also the case that social media is perhaps a completely new kind of environment that did not even exist when most of us were young. It certainly didn't exist when I was young. When I was uh, uh, in, my in, in, my, in my teens, uh, uh, we didn't even have computers. But it is, of course, a complete transformative fact that young people today uh, are exploring a completely new environment that goes beyond in-person relationships at home or in colleges, but with people they may never have even met. And all of this is through social media. And on this slide, what you can see is the very high coverage of uh, using social media. And of course, uh, the coverage is the highest for millennials compared to other age demographics. But the question really is, does the use of social media for young people actually have an effect on their well-being, on their psychosocial functioning, on their mental health? What does the evidence show? Well, the evidence shows quite a mixed picture. This particular slide from the Pew Research Center demonstrates that mixed picture very well. Clearly, it seems that some young people actually find that using social media has a very positive impact on their mental health, for example, through connecting with friends and family. And I'm pretty sure that that's probably even grown uh, during the pandemic months. But there is an important quarter who also describe negative effects, for example, due to cyberbullying. What's quite clear from this particular slide is that there isn't a single answer for the effect of social media on young people's mental health. I think there is a pretty single answer, for example, if I had to think of toxic environments in childhood and, and peer environments, but not such a straightforward story when it comes to social media. Maybe the question really is to unpack this and ask the question, who is vulnerable uh, from the adverse effects of social media rather than assuming that there's a blanket one size fits all effect across all young people. Indeed, more recent work, and I'm going to quote particularly from Amy Orban's work, who's done huge, uh, hugely important work on examining the effect of social media using very large uh, databases, such as in this particular paper from the US uh, a National Survey of Children's Health that is fielded by the US Census Bureau. And these data come from a few years ago. Uh, and I, I just want to highlight the, the main conclusion of this paper is that the influence on uh, psychosocial functioning is much smaller than has been uh, uh, often expected. Uh, and, 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 a, and a more recent paper of theirs that got published just last year, which, in, which involves three large population social data sets with more than 350,000 young people, uh, again, reports that just about 0.4% of the variation in well-being can be accounted for uh, by, by digital technology use. Um, I think it's important to point out that this is a very small variation compared to, say, for example, sexual uh, violence by other uh, young people in college environments or neglect during early childhood. So I think the jury is out on social media, and I don't want to say much more about social media now, apart from saying that clearly we need to continue to be 
cautious and we need to continue to investigate this further, um, but we shouldn't be jumping to any conclusions uh, with the evidence that we currently have. And finally, sticking to my theme of the why young people are experiencing such a tide of mental distress, psychological uh, 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 distress of suicidal behavior is of course uncertainty. Now uncertainty is a very major factor in all our lives. And uncertainty, which is oftentimes related to the concept of stress, stress is really very much about uncertainty, not knowing what's going to happen, is of course from an evolutionary perspective also something that is very much part uh, of the human condition. And it is because of uncertainty and stress that we have evolved a range of responses uh, that allow us to be actually responsive uh, to that stressful circumstance, to be prepared for an uncertain outcome uh, and to be able to survive. But it is when uncertainty is persistent, when uncertainty occurs in a context where there is no escape, when uncertainty occurs without any hope for a better future, when uncertainty occurs on the backdrop of toxic childhood and peer environments, it is then that uncertainty can become particularly damaging to our mental health. And there are several uncertainties that young people experience today. There's of course the huge uncertainty about the state of the planet that grown-ups, adults, and older adults will leave young people. The American Psychological Association has in fact gone as far as to coin a completely new term called eco-anxiety, which they define as a chronic fear of environmental doom. I know many of us share that uncertainty, but for young people, they have to look at a much longer life than we do on this planet and see a planet that is increasingly at threat. They look around us and they see the floods in the Southeast, they look at the fires in the West, they look at news stories of the melting ice caps, and that fuels a further fear of what the future holds. The second kind of uncertainty, of course, is the social cohesion, the harmony of our society. All around us, not just in the US, but in many countries around the world, um, we are seeing enormous polarization in the population. And the pandemic, in many ways, has actually fueled this even further. How does this kind of polarization affect mental health? Here I want to turn to the remarkable work of my colleagues, David Williams, Alex Sai, and others from, from uh, Harvard Medical School, from Harvard University. And I want to draw your attention to one you know, terrific example of how they have uh, they've used existing data sources to examine the question of whether the killing of unarmed Americans uh, affects the mental health of people from the same racial group uh, as that of the victim. And on the left-hand side, I want to, you can see a chart taken from that paper in The Lancet, which shows that the overall number of poor mental health days reported by Black Americans rises steeply in the weeks that follow the killing of an unarmed Black American. On the right-hand side, you can see the same results, but what you can also see that there is no such effect on when the, there is a killing of an armed person and indeed no such effect on white Americans when there is a killing of a white American by the police. Now, obviously one can interpret these results in many different ways, but the way I interpret this is that when you belong to historically disadvantaged uh, population, and this is particularly uh, a true of, the, of, of black Americans, that when the police kill an unarmed member of your own community, that this greatly increases the feelings of uncertainty and fear about your own well-being and security in the weeks immediately following the killing. And of course, COVID-19 has pretty much amplified these uncertainties and thrown a whole new range of uncertainties uh, for young people. Here's the, here's the irony. Young people are told that by and large, they're almost completely immune from this virus. Of course, there are instances of young people who have suffered extreme uh, um, uh, and unusual forms of immune reactions to the virus. But if you look at the actual prevalence of these uh, extreme uh, infectious uh, uh, um, effects, these are actually vanishingly small. And yet, what, we, what have we done? We've effectively created a situation where young people are no longer able to go to college, 
Young people are no longer able to socialize. Both of these are such fundamental needs for them. And of course, the job environment has completely evaporated. And so young people are facing a very bleak employment future. How is this affecting their mental health? Well, obviously the pandemic is still upon us and so we can only look at data that is still being collected. And luckily we already have some data sources that we can draw upon that tell us what lies ahead. This is data from uh, a study that my colleagues Cindy Liu and others are conducting, uh, and this is a live data. So I only have a results that she has uh, shared with me uh, specifically for this talk um, uh, from May uh, up until May 19, 2020. So it's a relatively small sample, and this is of course a purposive sample, but nevertheless you can already see dramatically high rates of loneliness, uh, low levels of distress tolerance, and if you had to use clinical threshold criteria, uh, astonishingly high rates of depression, anxiety, and PTSD. I mean, more than 40% for depression, anxiety. But we're also fortunate to have important data from the CDC, their highly regarded uh, uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report um, looked at the issue of mental health in the broader population. Um, and these are data from, their, uh, from June, which is the most recent data we have from the MMWR that tells us what the state of mental health in America is right in the midst of the pandemic. First of all, uh, just orienting yourself to the slide, on the left-hand side, you're gonna see anxiety and depressive disorder, and on the right-hand side, you're gonna see seriously considering suicide in the past 30 days. If we look at all respondents and young people, you can see, like the previous slide showed, astonishingly high rates, not only in the general population, but especially so in young adults with nearly two thirds of young adults in this population sample meeting clinical criteria for depression and anxiety. If we look at racial subgroups, um, very high rates across two of the historically disadvantaged racial subgroups. And if you had to look at uh, those young, uh, uh, those people who came from uh, uh, less educated backgrounds, again, you can see something that's very well known to those who research the social determinants of mental health, very high rates uh, in, in people who have had education less than a high school diploma. I should point out that these are not just young people, this is uh, the broader, the general population. So this slide confirms very, very high rates uh, of mental health problems and suicidal behavior is much higher than we've ever seen in the US at any recorded time in history. And this, unfortunately, might be the first signal of a very bleak future when it comes to mental health. The Nobel Prize winning economist Angus Deaton and uh, his colleague Anne Case published this book in April. I think it was incredibly timely. They could never have predicted, I think, how significant their work would be as we look ahead. The word debts of despair is a term they've coined to describe the fall in uh, life expectancy, the increase in premature mortality, particularly amongst white working class Americans, particularly in the Midwest, uh, following the financial crisis of 2008. Now, it's important to remember that that financial crisis really largely affected the US. Many, many other countries were relatively insulated because of a far stronger financial regulatory system in those countries. This time round, every country has been hammered by the pandemic. It isn't the case that the US can be pulled up by the rest of the global economy because the entire global economy is in turmoil. In fact, the president of the World Bank predicted not long ago that as many, hundred, as, many as 100 million people will be pushed back and I've outlined extreme because by the World Bank's definition of extreme poverty, that's living on less than $1 a day. And, and so that is really extreme poverty. If you consider more broadly people whose economic circumstances have worsened, it is predicted that at least half a billion people around the world have seen their economic well being hammered by the pandemic. And if it is the case that after the much milder economic recession, the financial crisis of 2008, we saw such an uh, increase in the wave uh, of mortality driven by suicide and substance use, then we should expect a similarly very, very dark future in terms of mental health of our young people uh, in the years ahead. I want to come to the final part of my talk now and think about a more promising way forward. Over the last decade, I've been very deeply involved with, it, with initiatives at the global level. And here I'm really going to draw uh, some of the innovations that are happening around the world and bring them to America. And I, I, I want to really remind ourselves that 
there, have been a, there has been a crisis of the lack of resources in many parts of the world when it comes to not just mental health, but even more broadly, health resources in general and economic resources. And it is in that context that global health has really been innovating in thinking about how we can address the burden of health problems in some of the least resourced parts of the world. And I've, put, I've been particularly involved both in adolescent health and in mental health. And my remarks that follow really follows on from my own leadership role in the Lancet Commission on Global Mental Health and my role in the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. And I'm really going to draw that together in my closing remarks. I also want to draw your attention to a very important report from the National Academy, uh, which specifically looked at how one could foster mental, emotional, and behavioral development in children and young people. And I, and I want to draw your attention to some of the key recommendations that are shown on this slide. And as you look at this slide, you will see um, that there's some very important themes that are consistently recurring here. And those themes are about, first of all, intersectorality, that we need to work with a diverse range of sectors in the community, Another theme is, of course, the need for community-facing workforces that are equipped with the necessary skills and scaffolding to be able to provide evidence-based intervention, and importantly, the need to build coalitions uh, in the community. Of course, though, we face many challenges in realizing some of these aspirational ideas in America. I think amongst those challenges, foremost really is the very narrow biomedical framing of mental health. Let's be honest, when we talk about mental health, most of us think of mental illness. And when we think of mental illness, most of us thinking, are thinking of diagnoses, of disorders. Much of this thinking actually has been driven not by science, but by the insurance industry. We have become very accustomed to dividing up the world in a binary way, those who have mental disorders and those who don't, because that's how reimbursements are made. But this is not borne out by either neuroscience or indeed by the needs of young people. We have very little tailoring of these biomedical approaches to the diverse needs of disadvantaged young people. We have very little attention to social determinants, which are so critical, as I've shown you already, in our mental health programs. And our definition of providers has been entirely dominated by a very narrow biomedical perspective, which usually privileges people who are MDs or PhDs. And of course, not only do we have a supply side problem when we think in that way, but there's also a great reluctance for young people to seek help from these kinds of highly specialized providers. About a decade ago, um, we, I, 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 along with the NIH, I was invited by the NIH, the NIMH, to co-chair their Grand Challenges and Global Mental Health Initiative. And this was essentially a research initiative which was intended to identify the leading priorities uh, in global mental health, which if addressed with adequate funding, could measurably reduce the burden of suffering globally due to mental health problems. Along with Pamela Collins, we ran a research priority setting exercise with more than 400 scientists, practitioners, and advocates from around the world. Incredibly, the leading research priorities were not about fundamental science. They were not about discovering the gene for schizophrenia or a new molecule or a vaccine, of course, which is a very interesting dominant conversation these days but they were about doing better with the knowledge we already have. Knowledge which in some cases is 50 years old, but we have been very, very remiss in actually translating that knowledge into practice. Since 2011, more than a half a billion dollars of new funding has been uh, committed to a large extent to the Global South and a significant proportion of that from the National Institute for Mental Health. And that body, of, of funding has transformed our understanding of mental health care in very, very critical ways. For example, that body of knowledge led by global mental health researchers, implementation scientists from around the world, but particularly so in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, have redefined the content of mental health interventions as an example, ensuring that mental health interventions are almost always combined with addressing social determinants of mental health. Mental health interventions are almost never provided in hospitals and specialty clinics, mainly because of course they hardly exist in many parts of the world, but in fact are provided in places where young people actually need them. For example, in school settings. 
Anyone with the adequate training and support can become a mental health provider, including teachers, social workers, and community health workers, and of course, most exciting of all, peer support workers. But what's really important is the how. That rather than training these workers to become mental health specialists, what we're really doing is training them to provide evidence-based interventions for prevention or care, using competency-based frameworks and with great attention to quality and supervision and support. The implications of this large body of evidence for young people's mental health is firstly to look beyond narrowly defined and diagnosed mental illness that focus on the base of the pyramid through task sharing, through empowerment of ordinary people and a variety of non-specialist providers to deliver psychosocial interventions for prevention and care. To balance individual clinical interventions with structural and social determinant interventions across the life course, and most importantly, to ensure that young people are at the center of all decisions from what matters to how it should be addressed. I wanna end now with a couple of videos uh, that shows uh, the work that my colleagues in India, Sangmat, have been doing that really embraces some of these ideas as a way of illustrating how some of these ideas can actually be operationalized in the real world. What you're about to see are videos uh, that come from India, and hopefully it'll also give you a, a flavor of some of the work that I personally have been leading and engaging with uh, over the last two decades. The first program I want to tell you about is a program uh, that I've been very passionate about, which is about promoting school climate, which is essentially promoting an environment in schools. And you'll see sh shortly in a video what that involves, uh, that really focuses on relationships. It, it is not about just equipping young people with knowledge, but most importantly, uh, in equipping uh, young people with the capabilities to transform relationships they have with each other and with the teachers in their school. On this particular slide, what you can see is really the theory of change uh, that this particular intervention sought to address. But I think the video that follows actually describes and shows what we did in the real world far better.
साथ में यहाँ मैदान में बहुत गंदे हुए थे तो उसे भी भरा गया जब हम आए थे स्कूल तो देखे कि बच्चा लोगों में स्वास्थ्य के प्रति बहुत ही कम ध्यान था बहुत ही कम लेकिन जब शहर कार्यक्रम में देखे स्वास्थ्य संबंधी सूचनाएं दीवार पत्रिका पे आने लगी जिससे देखे बच्चे लोग बहुत ही ज्यादा इम्प्रूवमेंट हुआ बच्चे लोग अपने सेहत के बारे में बहुत ही ध्यान रखने लगे स्कूल में साइंस लैब का नहीं था अब जब हम लोग साइंस लैब में करना चाहते थे तो हम लोग लिख के सिग्नेचर करवा के वेतन लिख के मतलब स्लीपर बॉक्स में डाला सर उसका सब धान निकाले यहाँ साइंस लैब भी हो गया हम लोग साइंस लैब भी जाते हैं लाइब्रेरी भी जाते हैं कंप्यूटर लैब भी जाते हैं जिम क्लासेस भी जाते हैं बच्चों में गार्जियन में सभी में एक उत्सुकता जाती है कुछ करने को लेकर के क्योंकि कल तक जहां विद्यालय में कोई भी प्रोग्राम ना होता था अगर हुआ भी तो उतना बच्चे लोग उतना ज़्यादा इंटरेस्टेड नहीं होते थे लेकिन आज है कि अगर विद्यालय में कोई भी प्रोग्राम करवाया जाता है तो सभी बच्चे विद्यालय में पढ़ने वाले उसमें भाग लेने के लिए उत्सुक दिखते हैं लेकिन सब सीख में देखिए आगे हम भविष्य बढ़ता है कि हमें आगे जाकर क्या करना चाहिए और क्या नहीं करना चाहिए इससे हमें जानकारी हो जाती है इस तरीके का प्रोग्राम अगर चलते रहता है तो विद्यालय में इस तरीके का एक्टिविटी होते रहता है और इसका लाभ बच्चों को निरंतर मिलता रहेगा जिससे उनमें एक प्रतिभा जागेगी उनका भविष्य And so I'm going to continue now and show you the results. We published these results in the Lancet and PLOS Medicine. And what you can see here is that a baseline, it was a cluster randomized control trial. By the way, I should have, I was remiss not to mention that this was conducted in one of the poorest states in the world. Uh, Bihar is one of the least resource parts, not only of India, but the whole world. And the schools we worked in were government schools in which there were very, very few teachers and very large student bodies. So what you can see here is that baseline mean depression scores were the same in all the three arms. The three arms were a usual care arm, uh, that is to say, you only had a curricular life skills program. And then you had the Sahara intervention delivered by two different uh, providers, the lay counselor who was a local young person recruited from the local community or one of the existing teachers. And what's really interesting is, of course, you see dramatic dose response effects over two years in reducing depression scores at the whole population level in contrast to no effects at all in, in, in the other two arms. And then if you look at the prevalence of school violence, again, you see dramatic reductions by more than 50% um, in either experiencing physical threats of violence in the last six months or perpetrating physical threats of violence um, in the last six months. But again, only restricted to when you have an external counselor who is actually coordinating the program rather than an existing teacher. And I think actually this kind of evidence that students connect much better when they have someone other than the teacher who's actually doing the non-pedagogical activities in the school, promoting health and well-being, um, is actually also emerging from many other contexts as well. And again, we can talk about why that might be uh, in a moment. These, these, um, this particular program was conducted uh, in secondary schools, so that would be around the ages of 14 to 16. But we've also been working in another program in, in India uh, with young adults, more like in the ages of 18 to 24. And here what we're trying to do is a somewhat different kind of program, which is to engage young people in conversations about mental health in the broader sense, in the broader sense that I described earlier, not about mental illness, but about struggles that young people face in their everyday lives and to share these stories in a creative and artistic way so that you can also embrace uh, the arts as a way of communicating and engaging ever widening numbers of people. We call it Manmela, which is really intended to be a museum of art that is based on a collaboration between young people and artists. And again, another short video, just a minute long, to show you how that works out. It's something that we've just started about six months ago.
It's not always easy to talk openly about our mental health, both our struggles and our victories. But when we do, we let others know that they are not alone. Sharing our stories with others can inspire them, offer hope, and help them. Man Mela is a museum about young people's mental health stories from India. We feature stories from different parts of the country that tackle common misconceptions about mental health, highlight common problems, and share information on how to seek help and build resilience. Our storytellers work with a team of researchers, writers, and designers who help bring their stories to life using art and technology, enabling viewers to interact with their worlds as they travel through journeys of finding hope, identity, meaning, and empowerment. Our stories matter, and telling them can make a big difference. So I want to end now um, by simply saying that it's a historic opportunity for us to reframe and reimagine mental health as a global public good, not just as a health problem, but genuinely as a global public good, just in the same vein as we talk about our environment and social harmony. So it is a universal human quality that is indivisible from our health, but it's much more than just our health. It actually defines who we are as human beings. It is our greatest personal asset. It is important to all people in all countries, and particularly so to young people, and never before has it been so important. It is this generation of adolescents and young adults who will transform all our futures and not just theirs. And there is no greater priority in my mind, not just in global health, but right home here in the US, than ensuring that they have the right resources. Thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge the many people who've helped me put this lecture together. Uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Well, thank you so much, Vikram, for such a fascinating and challenging, um, I think quite hopeful lecture, really. Um, I'd like now, um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce uh, Professor Deborah Gorman-Smith, um, who is the Dean of the um, School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. And he, she will open a discussion with uh, Professor Patel. Um, Deborah Gorman-Smith is the Dean and the Emily Klein Gidowitz Professor at the School of Social Service Administration. She's also the um, Director of the Chicago Center for Youth Violence Prevention. And her research aims to understand the development, the risks, and the prevention of aggression and violence with a focus on minority youth living in urban communities. Professor Gorman Smith led a United Nations study on violence against children. She was a member of the United Kingdom's Department of Health Study Group on Primary Prevention of Antisocial Behavior. And in the US, she has served at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the Centers for Disease Control. Um, Professor Deborah. Gorman Smith, Deb, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you, Jonathan, um, and uh, thank you. It is such an honor to be here. Um, I am um, an enormous fan of Professor Patel's work, um, and so it, uh, I'm so sorry that we're not able to be here in person because I would love to have this opportunity. Um, and I just want to thank you for um, bringing attention to this enormous public health crisis, um, but also importantly, showing us that there is a way forward because um, it can feel pretty hopeless at times. Um, I know many people have questions, but I thought um, uh, I would uh, take the prerogative <laughs> to, uh, to, to talk about some things that are, are most on uh, front of mind for me. Um, as you said, this is a, a, a crisis uh, in all places, um, but we also know that, um, that the burden is not equally distributed and that communities, particularly in the US, black and brown communities suffer the disproportionate burden 
um, of all of the kinds of stressors um, that you've talked about. Um, um, but particularly during this time, we know that those communities have also suffered the disproportionate burden of COVID. Many children have lost family and friends. Um, they've also suffered the disproportionate burden and the impact that, that you showed so clearly around the impact of racism and violence. Um, before COVID, we did um, a survey of about 1,700 youth in schools around the University of Chicago and found that 37% of 6th, 8th, and 10th, and 12th graders to have uh, rate, high rates of anxiety and, and nearly 25% rates of depression. Um, given all that has happened in the seven months and, and given the data that you showed, um, I'm concerned about what that will look like in a couple of months. Um, and most of these youth um, have not been in school for the last seven months. They haven't been in school since March. Um, and as you know, that's a place where many youth receive um, mental health services or even some sort of tiered approach. Um, and at least in Chicago, it doesn't look like our youth will be returning back to in-person learning anytime soon. Um, so I'm worried. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can be thinking about um, intervening, reaching out, um, continuing to do this work under the current circumstances. Thank you, Deborah. You know, this is a very politically charged question, and it's a pity that it's political rather than purely a, a, a science-based uh, conversation. But even with the science, I am a little concerned that when we talk about the science of COVID-19 and how we can minimize risks uh, of transmission, that the voices of young people have been almost completely absent from what I can make out. Uh, I think it's mainly the gerontocracy of science that is dominating here, the gerontocracy of politics that is dominating here. And I believe that that is a very important missing piece. If young people were engaged, if they were met, if they were treated, I think as trusted, responsible members of our society, that I think there would have been a very different kind of response. If young people were made to see why closing institutions was in their interest, why going to in-person was in their interest and how they actually viewed this and how it could be made more personable, I don't know how much of that has happened. I know there are islands where this has happened, but the honest truth is most of these decisions are being made by hierarchies that are far removed from the lives of young people. Um, and this kind of top-down thing, you know, I have to say global health has always prized itself as being uh, driven bottom up. The whole idea of the voices of those who are affected being at the center of all decision-making, that, basic guiding principle I see has been jettisoned here. So young people and children who have been so profoundly affected have basically been treated as bystanders who must pay the price um, without them being actively consulted. I know I'm using very provocative language here, but I think the point I want to make here is their absence in the whole conversation, the discourse, I think is, 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 is one thing we could have done differently, engaging them right. Whoever is affected, we have to engage them. Uh, I think the question of the of, of, of schools and colleges, you know, it's you're absolutely right that mental health services are delivered there, but there's a lot more than that. For low-income young people, actually, this is often the only environment they will get outside their homes where they can actually engage with other people, get a sense of what the rest of the world looks like. Now they're trapped at home, often in extremely crowded environments, often having to share devices, often having to have great difficulty actually engaging with remote learning. We've assumed that all young people, regardless of class or color, somehow have the same wonderful homes that we in academia have. And I think there is a real, there's another fundamental problem there. You know, there is actually a bias that operates that the people who are making decisions such as this actually have no real idea what it means to be poor or, or to live in a home which is very crowded or to live in a place where the internet connection is lousy. We don't even know what that looks like 
most of us. So that's the second thing. And the third thing I want to say, and I'll end uh, on this, is that outside the US, the other really important point to make is that you know, schools and educational institutions are often the only place where young people get their food. You know, I know that this is also true in some communities in the US, but in India, for example, for the vast majority of children, the main meal of the day is the meal that the school authorities provide the kids. So it isn't the case just that you go to school for education, which you can Im immediately pivot to a, a Zoom platform, but it is a lot more that educational institutions give young people. Uh, and all of that has been essentially removed with no compensation on how those, those essential needs can be met. And I think that is a problem. So I think the conversation of how we open educational institutions in a safe way is a very urgent one. Uh, and I, I think we should move away from binaries, shut or open. There has to be some kind of middle ground that allows the risk of transmission to be minimized, but doesn't throw young people under the bus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, thinking about how we prioritize, you know, had we, to your point, brought those voices in and if we had prioritized education and getting kids back into school, I think we would have made some very different choices early on. Um, one of the other things in this space of, as you said, schools provide uh, very more than just education and mental health services, but um, one of the things that I'm struck by in your work also is the uh, you talk in places about this pyramid and thinking about the ways that we can um, use other members of the community to help support well-being and mental health. Um, and you know, one of the challenges that, and I absolutely agree with you to think about how can we be more creative and, and think about you know, peer professionals or whatever kind of language you might want to use. And the biggest challenges that I've seen in, in having these conversations are often my own colleagues who are concerned about um, somehow diminishing uh, what it takes to provide mental health services, the skills, the experience, the education. So I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to, to how we might face some of those challenges. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And I, I, I do agree with those concerns that the idea should never be to dumb down and it should never be that has, you know, one, 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 of, one, of, the, one of the concerns is that we're using, you know, um, we're shortchanging the poor, you know, instead of investing in specialized services that can be accessed by everyone, regardless of class uh, or ethnicity, what we're doing is we're providing a poorer quality service to those who are poor. Uh, and I am very, very sensitive to that a concern as well. So let me be clear, this is not about replacing mental health services. It's about expanding the footprint of mental health services. So in the US today, by the, uh, by the data that the CDC uh, produces itself, about half of the US population that has a mental health need has not accessed any kind of care, any kind, any kind, including their primary care practitioner uh, in the previous 12 months. And so it's very evident that even with all the resources we have at the moment in this country, we are not meeting at least half, if not more than half. And certainly there are also huge disparities in, in that coverage. So that's an aggregate number, but you know, if I had to look at low-income families or low-income communities, it would be even higher. Twinned with that is the fact that we're seeing a rising burden. So we weren't even able to meet the existing burden. And now the burden has been rising for the last decade and is going to rise even faster in the coming year. We've got to come up with a solution that doesn't involve training uh, more PhDs and MDs, which takes 10 years for any one of those, and then requires, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars to achieve that. There has to be some other sort of, you know, balance approach in mental health care. And so the approach we're talking about is not just the base of the pyramid. It's adding the base of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid. So we've only focused, I believe, in a lot of our thinking about mental health care. And let me be honest, this also applies to health care more generally. At the top of the pyramid, the hospitals, the specialists, um, the MDs. And I think we need to continue recognizing that they play a very important role, but in a very specialist context. A huge amount of people's health needs are not that specialized. They're not that complex. And so you've got this paradox where highly trained people 
are actually spending their precious time, their expensive time, handling issues that could just as easily have been handled by somebody who was based in the community, cost far less, and was much more accessible. So what I'd like to see is a future in which problems are managed in a stepped way, that everyone has access to a first responder who's fully equipped with basic skills for mental health care, but that that first responder is not operating in a vacuum, that that first responder is operating in an organized healthcare system so they can seamlessly refer people who have more specialized needs or who are more unresponsive to that first responder care to more specialized providers. In that way, the specialist is actually doing what they have spent 10 years learning to do. Um, you know, providing specialist care to people with specialist needs, as opposed to spending a lot of their time doing basic mental health care. And then as a result of that, a large number of people out in the community don't actually have mental health care. I want to end by just simply saying, Deborah, we really have a crisis in America. It, the best crisis, the best reflection of that crisis is the number of people with serious mental illness in our prisons. You know, I mean, uh, there is there is a one statistics from the National Advocacy Center that suggests that in more than 40 states of the U.S., there are more people with serious mental illness in prison than there are in care. So I think there is a crisis, and simply looking at the top of the pyramid as the only place of action is not going to fix it. Well, I know that there are many questions in the chat, so I think I will turn it over to Jonathan, who. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Deborah, and um, uh, thank you. And we do have some questions. Um, I would like to just start with a question of my own, um, having listened to your lecture, because not just because it's me, but because I, mine is, I think, the more global question of, in terms of the, the list of questions, which I'll then get to. But the, the, what you have done, I think, is show us this global perspective um, not just geographical, but also across um, income divides and uh, racial divides and um, um, all, all sorts of divides. But the, um, the question that I have is, um, um, this seems to be something that's been going on for a generation. I mean, there's a, it's, a, it's a 20 year, um, it looks like a 20 year period affecting um, all groups. Um, and that is very puzzling to me. I, I've had the opportunity over the past few years to be uh, to talk to um, heads of mental hygiene clinics of major universities and colleges. Um, and they're, I mean, people do come from socially diverse backgrounds, but they're in quite a, um, you know, privileged learning environment. And the um, statistics there uh, about depression, anxiety, um, suicide, thoughts and suicide, very alarming. And so part of the question I have is, I mean, you think there's some ways we don't yet understand that we're, we as a culture are teaching um, unhappiness or lack of mental health? Um, I mean, it's, that's, that's sort of a, a question I have. That's a very, very provocative question, Jonathan. I, I don't know if I haven't, I haven't got given enough thought to that particular question to be able to answer with any sense of confidence. Um, but my gut reaction is I don't think we are teaching young people to be unhappy, but we're not creating the circumstances for them to actually experience happiness. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's, a, it's an act of commission, but I think it's an act of omission. You know, I think we have for a long time recognized that the environments that young people face, uh, as I've already depicted, uh, are, are, can be quite toxic. And, you know, we've now latched onto social media. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that social media is, is without harm. But I'm just thinking there's a lot of other known harms that are far more pervasive and are far more universal, you know, that we need to be acting on, such as sexual violence um, against young people. You know, I think we should all be shocked by those figures from the surveys of young people in colleges. I mean, it's absolutely unbelievable. Um, we should all be shocked about the um, amount of neglect and deprivation in childhood in this country. You know, the wealthiest country in the world. It is unforgivable un, um, that 20% of our children grow up in a household that is defined as living in conditions of quite significant poverty. And one of the things I want to say is that it isn't just belonging to historically disadvantaged group. I think that is extremely important, but it's also belonging to a low income community, regardless 
of what your racial and ethnic background is. Of course, these two overlap a lot, but they don't overlap fully. And I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that poverty is also an incredibly important toxic factor in, in, in the development of young people. So my, my feeling is that I think the real policy action has to surely be for us to make a clarion call to really act on those environments at home and in schools. And of course, you know, young people, for particularly for young people, our, our neighborhoods and our broader communities, no question on my mind, Jonathan, that the violence that we're seeing, you know, the, 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 the protests that we're seeing right now are, are a way to vent anger and rage that many young people feel about injustice in this country. And I think we have to really target those. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't think that we're teaching them unhappiness, but God knows we're, we're not acting on the things that we know are making people unhappy. And that is what we should be really focusing our energies on. I want to say one more thing about mental health services. I totally agree with you that college campuses are reporting very high rates of help seeking and Harvard is no exception. Um, and I think we should strengthen those services. But in Harvard, for example, we've started an approach of peer counseling. And that's a really, really wonderful example of where you can, you know, as for build the base of the pyramid for student mental health. So rather than saying that everyone has to necessarily see a counselor in the clinic, there are opportunities for young people to reach out to other young people in the college community, in the graduate or undergraduate community who have been trained and are being supported by the university health services. They've been trained in providing first responder or basic mental health care. And to me, that's a really nice example of, as it were, bringing global health back into the American college campus. Wonderful. Uh, we have, thank you, Vikram. Uh, we have some lots of questions and I'll do my best to get through as many as I can. Uh, one comes from um, one of, a, a teacher who asks um, about teaching remotely and trying to balance remote and in-person teaching. But in, in the time that we are teaching uh, remotely, are there things we teachers could be looking for in our students to help them or, you know, um, how to help them in, 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 a, in a Zoom environment and um, what we should be looking for if, if um, things don't, don't look, you know, it looks like we could help and how. Yeah, well, you know, if you're fortunate to be a teacher in a school where you have a relatively small class size, um, then I think the most important thing is to get to know each student individually in terms of the circumstances that they are facing at home for remote teaching. Uh, I think that that would be very important, you know, so, and it doesn't take a lot of time, you know, essentially to find out where they're connecting, what device do they use, what's the quality of the internet, is there some degree of privacy that they have, etc. And then being able to tailor some of your teaching to recognize the diversity of experiences that students in your classroom have. I think that's terribly important. Rather than you know, targeting everything to the average or to those who might be in fact, leave aside the average, kids who might have everything working for them, to really be actually targeting things for embracing diversity. For those kids who have struggles with all of these technology requirements that are needed for effective uh, remote learning, I wonder whether there might even be space if you're fortunate to have time to do more individual uh, 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 support for those students because they can't just keep up with the average class, not because they can't keep up because of any personal capability issues, but because they simply aren't, tech, they don't have the right tech, uh, tech, tech, technology at their disposal. One more thing we do with teachers in schools that we work with is to make sure that some of your Zoom is not learning Zoom. It's entirely, and I'm sure many, many teachers are doing that in the US as well, that some of the Zoom is like what you do in the playground or like you do, uh, you know, in the cafeteria, you know, it's, it's a Zoom without an agenda, zero agenda. It's basically a Zoom to chat and to get, especially to get the young people to talk about how things are going at home, how things are going in their minds, you know, what's been troubling them and to get people having a conversation about their well-being is fundamentally important. And I'd suggest that that should happen at, at least once a month, if not every week. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And th there's a cluster of questions that circulate around um, the, the, the um, issue of mental health. Um, the question is the, the, the extent to which um, it's a political issue um, and what it yeah. would be um, realistically to try and promote mental well-being um, I think the questions are, are, are focusing more on the U.S. context and global context. Um, but the question is, you know, as a as a um, 
as a, a kind of intervention into um, society, helping make uh, mental health uh, a, a, an issue. How does one do that successfully in in you in, know in, in the world we're now living in? So first of all, I want to say that all health is political, and we don't need to look the mental health for that. Look at COVID-19 in this country, you know, I mean, um, you know, so let's not make any mistake. The idea that health is purely the domain of biomedicine is something we should disclaim immediately. You know, health is fundamentally a political issue. The health of the people is ultimately a political decision. To what extent does the politics of any country protect its people from known harms, to what extent does the politics of a country uh, 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 you know, empower and entitle people in that country to accessing universal health coverage? These are political decisions. They have nothing to do with biomedicine. So let's be clear about that. And as much as I think many of the mental health concerns I've talked about have deep political uh, underpinnings, so does COVID-19, so does tuberculosis, so does HIV, so does many other things. So that's important. Now, here's the in interesting thing to your question response about how do you get mental health up the political agenda? I think mental health is probably one of the only issues for which there's bipartisan agreement in, in the Congress. You know, Everyone agrees it's a problem. Uh, and especially if you think of certain groups in the American population like veterans, there is unanimous agreement. There should be more spending. There should be more support. There's a crisis of suicide. So actually, this may well be the one issue in America to get today that is not polarized and divisive. Um, I think where we really do need uh, to, 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 to ask the question is that there is enormous political consensus, both nationally and globally, that mental health is important. How do we take the science that I have summarized today, the dimensional approach to mental health, moving away from binaries, recognizing that biomedicine is important, but there are also many other things beyond biomedicine that are profoundly important. Recognizing that prevention is just as relevant to mental health as controlling tobacco use is to, is, is, is to cardiac health. Um, so when, how do we make sure that the narrative, the consensus is not hijacked by just one perspective on mental health, and it takes some, embraces a much broader uh, perspective, a much broader diversity of experiences and strategies. Oh, thank you so much. There's also questions, I mean, maybe I'll just keep going with it because there's another question came in. I won't read it all out, but, um, but, uh, but just pushing you a bit, there's a, someone else wrote in about the particular fragmented healthcare system we have in the United States, um, as opposed to, let's say, Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I know that poses, I mean, special problems. Yeah. How would you address, you know, these things in our particular environment of, um, of healthcare providers? So, you know, Jonathan, I'm a great believer in working locally. Uh, you know, you can't fix the world by, by doing things from the top, particularly when there's, of course, such a polarizing debate about the, the, the architecture of healthcare in the US. And so I don't believe that we have an immediate solution to that. But instead, what I do is I work locally. I work with whoever wants to work in building the base of the pyramid in an organized healthcare system. And you know, there are many parts of the US uh, where there is a semblance of universal health coverage. I mean, there are many great players on the, on the West Coast, for example, who provide uh, you know, excellent quality of care for all their members. So that's what I do. And you develop models of working with local action, local engagement, and hope that as you do that, people will take notice further up the food chain, especially people who are lawmakers and begin to see the value of that kind of local universal coverage of, of healthcare. But I agree with you, this is, this is the elephant in the room. The real problem is, is, is the architecture of our healthcare system. And also the fact that it's so heavily driven by the insurance industry. I think that's a problem too, because I, I have a lot of mental health professionals who tell me, look, we love what you say, you're exactly right. You know, in fact, neuroscience tells us that there is no clear line to, in the sand to divide people up in the binary way we do, but insurance companies want a code. And so we're forced to do that. Mm -hmm. Let me ask one last question. I'll just squeeze it in uh, before we, and uh, there's also a cluster of questions about how the neuroscience you were just explaining of the um, adolescent brain and you know all we've learned about the development of the brain during this period should affect uh, juvenile um, policy with respect to law, law enforcement, um, the courts, 
What, what do you think about that? Absolutely, Jonathan. I, am a, I have a very clear view on this. To treat a adolescent, I would say, extending all the way into your early 20s, which is really pushing the boundary in terms of the law, as, as if they have the same decision-making capabilities as an adult is fundamentally contrary to the neuroscience, fundamentally. And if our lawmaking has to follow the science, we have to have a significant rethink on the issue of responsibility and how it's graduated with time. And so I, I believe that this is a far more fundamental conversation. It, it absolutely astonishes me that a 19 year old should be treated as an adult, uh, oftentimes for crimes that are entirely understandable as impulsive risk taking behavior. A crime is a crime. I'm not for a moment justifying something that is socially unacceptable, but it's a question of what kind of uh, uh, you know, sentencing you get. Um, and I think there should be far more use of corrective, uh, uh, you know, uh, restorative justice, really, rather than punitive justice particularly for young people, because the only thing that punitive justice will do is to further enhance the sense of anger and rage. Uh, and I, I don't believe it actually makes young people learn that they have actually, they need to actually think before they act. Vikram, Professor Vikram Patel, Deborah, Deb, Professor Deborah Gorman-Smith, thank you so much, both of you, for such a great conversation. I think my greatest hope is that it's the beginning of a conversation that really endures. Um, and to the audience, I'd like to say thank you for joining us and good night. Thank you, Jonathan. Good night.